Think of the time you had a real good defeat. What did you think of yourself? Do you really like it? In other words, do you like to be beat up? Do you like to not make it? Do you like to come in at the end of the week without any sales? In other words, do you like to feel like there's something missing? I haven't got it. I can't tell my wife I don't feel like I'm up to what I should be. In other words, I don't really think I'm a man anymore. Do you like this kind of a feeling of being defeated? No. We were created to win. How many times? Nine out of ten? No. I believe we're made to win. There's no other way we're going to be happy. In other words, I've studied the entire psychological makeup of a human being and you do not have anything in your psychological makeup to handle defeat. There's nothing within us for defeat. We're made for victory and if you're going to actually cut yourself off from power, are you going to be miserable? All right, now the next question is how much power do you have to have? I'll let you think for a moment. How much power would you like tonight? Power means, again, what? To do what you want, when you want, without any resistance from anyone. Now, how much power would you like? In other words, I, if I could just give you all the power you wanted tonight, in other words, you just write on a piece of paper how much, and then I'll just <coughs> hand it to you. And since we're going this far, I'll do it on a golden platter. You walk out of here tonight, you can have the golden platter with it. All right, now, what would you write down on your sheet of paper? All you could get. You're talking about infinite? All right, now, the secret tonight is to learn the greatest art in interpersonal relationships that I know of, and we're going to call it just simply one word tonight, submission. Now, have you gathered by now, is submission have any relationship with weakness? In other words, if you've got a definition in your mind that submission means weakness, we're defining submission as power. Now, let's take an illustration. Japan surrendered to the United States. Japan was submissive. Had they won the war, they would not be as well off economically as they are tonight. We're saying then that submission did what for Japan? By the way, you know how they arrived at their beautiful economic situation? They threw up a white flag. In other words, they surrendered. Now, had they surrendered to Russia, would it have been the, that way? I want you to see that submission has to be to whom? To whoever is in the chain of command. In other words, if you submit to something that's not in the chain, do you get any power at all? In other words, let's talk to the gentleman for just a minute. Let's assume your wife is very submissive to you and you've given her a lot of power. Tomorrow she decides, I'm going to get more power, so she submits to the next door neighbor. In other words, we're assuming that the next door neighbor is out of the chain of command. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, what's her power supply? She's cut off. When her husband comes home, does he want to delegate any more authority? Well, he'd like to take back all that he's already <laughs> delegated. Have I wet your appetite enough tonight to want to know how to play the female role to obtain infinite power? If you play the female role the way we're going to describe tonight, and you're lined up in the chain of command, and that chain of command is directly from the ultimate source of power, which is God, will you have infinite power to carry out any detail that is in front of you to overcome any resistance or friction in your path and believe me with the elements the way they are today with the weather the way it is today with the ideas and the breakdowns do you need a lot of power the more I see of this world the more I think you just got to have extra all the time to meet the unexpected obstacles that come in your way all right what we want to do now is learn the secrets of submission for the purpose of having infinite power. In other words, to play our female roles. And am I talking now to the men as well as the ladies? Every man here is playing a female role. There's no question about it. If you don't believe it, you're playing one right now. You walk out of here and stop to buy something to eat on the way home and you're going to do it again. In fact, every time you turn around, you play the female role. 
In other words, a female role would be any of the roles of where you are being serviced by somebody else. In fact, you played the female role to 150 men to have breakfast this morning. Think about it for a minute. In other words, it took 150 men to bring the food to your table this morning. I don't know any way on earth for you to get out of the female role. I mean, you're in. You're going to do one of two things. You can rebel against it and break it and live in a state of rebellion. And that's a horrible thing to go around contesting the male. He knows more than you do. He's got more power. In almost every situation of the male role, like go to the doctor, the doctor plays the male role. What can you do? Tell him, well, you don't know what you're doing today. You don't even know what it looks like, the thing he's going to take out. And you don't even ever get to see it anyway. In fact, how do you know he took anything out? <laughs> You're beginning to see it's almost ridiculous for the female role to try to contest the male role on knowledge. You best surrender. Let's go through her first characteristic. The first thing she has to do to be successful in life is to fall head over heels in love with herself. She has to be too valuable to have moods. She has to know that she's too precious to fight. In other words, any type of contest is below her dignity. In other words, she's above what we describe in the word commerce. She's too expensive, too dear to enter into any type of struggle or competition. And we have to hold her here, and she has to visualize herself this way. In other words, she has to put nice things on, clean clothes, have her fingernails manicured beautifully, her hair done. In other words, all of these things are little tiny incidents, but when we put them all together, are they signifying to her that she's important, that she is valuable? And I think if you're a parent here tonight, you should try to actually have your children fall in love with themselves by age two. I mean, where they can just actually stand in front of a mirror for five minutes and admire themselves. In other words, where they just really think they're great. In other words, they should really fall in love with themselves. You tell them, instead of screaming at them wildly, and you say, you know, the way you move your hand is charming. Little remarks all day long. In other words, little things about what they do. Not so much always their physical appearance, but little things they do. Like when my littlest one, when he first learned the word thank you, the way he would say it. Now, by the way, he doesn't even talk yet, but do we tell him how great he is? We must have. You should see the way he acts. He thinks he's king. <laughs> In other words, he really acts as if he is king. This is what you've got to do to these children so that they can love themselves because what you want from your child above everything else is for that child to love you. And always remember, the only amount of love you're ever going to get from that child is what he's already generated toward himself. Now, most parents would like to extract the love for themselves first, and if there's any left over, then let him use it on himself. But always remember, the law states, I can't have any feelings going out unless I have already had these feelings toward myself. Now, when she's fully and completely in love with herself, she's capable of loving others. And I would tell you tonight that you would find very, very few American women who are capable of loving anybody. That's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. Oh, they'll tell you before they marry you that they're madly in love with you. But it's all part of the game. It's all part of the conniving. It's all part of trying to get what you want. When I'm through tonight describing her, you'll know what I mean by love. In other words, you could say tonight we're going to spend three hours describing love. And I realize I'll be describing a creature that will be so different from anything that a lot of you have ever seen. Now, when she's fully in love with everybody, a real Pollyanna, she has to come to a conclusion that she has definite needs of other people. In other words, she's not one of these self-sufficient pioneer-type spirits that makes her own soap out of lying ashes. <laughs> she knows that her precious sanity 
is based on receiving the seven A's and these can only come from other people. And she feels no fear from this. In other words, she thinks it's a thrill to know that the people around her are giving her seven A's and this is causing her to be sane. Again, teach your children before they're two that they need the seven A's. It's a horrible thing to rear a daughter in this world and not even break her in on the first six steps that we're going to give you tonight and then throw her out on some unsuspecting male and expect him in two years to teach her everything that you didn't teach her. And when he doesn't come up to the task and he fails with this neurotic that you've given him, then what do you think of him? What you've done to my poor daughter, it was already done before he ever come along. In other words, you should have your daughter knowing that she needs a seven A's, and if she doesn't have them, she's going to go crazy. It's that clear cut tonight. In other words, if you do not have the seven A's, you cannot be psychologically sound, and you will actually suffer from insanity. Number four, you should teach her not to fear, and above all, not to fear involvement. Now, what do we do with American girls? Well, just let every lady here just think what your mother told you about boys. They'll get you one way or another. <coughs> Don't take candy from strangers. The whole bit. In other words, we think the best security we can possibly have with sex is what? Scare them to death. That's not the solution. I dare you to perform a psychological miracle at the wedding ceremony and completely change them instantly from hate men to love men in one magic stroke. They're going to carry the same feelings all the next 20 years in marriage that you drilled into them the first 20 years. There's no way on earth to get it out of them. So in other words, what we say is that we teach everyone who's playing the female role to have no fear. Now, the purple dye that we start out with tonight, let's see just how much it's colored us here. Is it feminine? for a woman to scream when she sees a mouse. It doesn't even have to be something as big as a mouse. It could be a spider. But we were less than an ounce in weight. Now, if you were going to a prize fight tonight and you were going to bet your money and one contender weighed 124 pounds and was five foot five, and the other contender weighed one eighth of an ounce, with this kind of a prize fight, if you're going to wager, there would be no question you would wager on the girl. But if her husband was in the ring, he would wager on the spider. Now, the reason we say American women like to be afraid of little things is because they have a namby-pamby husband. And in order for him to prove he's a man, they have to reduce themselves to something fearful. And by reducing themselves to something fearful, it allows the husband to kill the thing that they were afraid of. If he can put a worm on a fish hook, he can become a man. She's afraid to let him encounter anything bigger than the worm for fear he might run or might hide. So we say then, should a woman have fear of anything? All right now, if you want to go out of here tonight and be truly feminine, will you be afraid of anything again? In other words, to be a real woman, you're not afraid. Sometimes, if you'd like to, read the 31st chapter of Proverbs. And then when you get through, ask yourself, could a woman full of fear do any of those things? The answer will be no. In other words, if you have fear, then the woman who's described in the 31st chapter of Proverbs doesn't exist. All right, now let me tell you a secret. If you're afraid, can you submit? No. All right, now this actual fear, normally we say fear of involvement. In other words, we want the female role to actually not be afraid to involve themselves just as much as they can in every situation. Now, if I'm a sales manager tonight and I have a salesman working for me, is he any good to me if he has an actual fear of involvement? No, he won't go out. He won't actually, in many situations where he can actually go out and make a lot of sales for me, he'll be afraid to. 
we say then that to, for you to play a good female role tonight, you actually have to reach the place where you have no fear whatsoever. Before we go any further in this, let me describe that the basic inherent desire, and we can go clear through back to biological and psychological desire of a woman, is to throw herself, now watch this close, at the feet of a man as a living sacrifice to forever give up every right that she will ever have on the face of the earth and to live only with one desire and that is to find out what his whims, his opinions, his wishes and his desires are and then to give everything in her being to fulfill them without any hope of obtaining anything for herself. This is beautiful if there were a man. And I have talked to several women and at times I've spoken to groups as large as 300 and they come up afterwards and they say, yes, you described it perfectly. I've got those feelings. But I've never found anyone worthy of such a sacrifice. Then they'll go on to tell you, well, I asked this question, did you get married? Oh, yes, I picked the one that I thought I could mold into such a character. And as soon as I had him molded that way, then I'm going to make the sacrifice. But she's waiting in a critical atmosphere, by the way, which means he'll never have a chance. Normally they give up about 50. In other words, they're never going to make anything out of him. And then they compromise. And by the way, when we talk about compromise, are we talking about role relationship? No. We're talking about contest. Then they compromise for what we call this noble word, companionship. By the way, when you're past 50, you're thinking about dying anyway. You don't want to get old alone. And after all, he's just as good as the next one anyway, because you haven't found any other man anywhere anyway along the way. So then you resign yourself to companionship with this would-be man. But wouldn't it be nice to have a knight on a white horse come by? So you could fulfill the very basic parts of your inmost desires. Number five, she has to have a knowledge of role relationship. I'm thinking of a real precious woman who ruined all of her children. She came to me after a seminar and she said, you know, I have been married some 25 years. She says, when I was married, I was taught it's a 50-50 affair. She says, I didn't want to fight. I didn't feel like struggling, but I wanted to carry my part of the load. Now, can you watch how her sincerity is getting her into trouble? She went in because she thought it was her duty. She picked up half of the responsibility and half of the authority at least that's what she thought she was doing, and she struggled. And she taught her children very clearly what contest was. Now when they come home to visit her, it's contest. She would just love to have a role relationship with any one of them, but she can't. She has established role relationship with her husband. In fact, she came to me one night after seminar, and she said the past week was the best week of her life. She had given up. She had surrendered. And she had let him take over the entire job of running the household. Now, these first five things that I've given you tonight are the basic responsibilities of the male role in the home that the girl is reared in. In other words, the father should fulfill the first five functions. Now, of course, if you marry a girl and she's on step one, where do you begin as a husband? Step one. Never blame her parents for the problems that you have. When you marry her, you are assuming responsibility for everything that she is or ever has been. But the ideal way would be for the first five steps to be accomplished before marriage. In other words, a husband should come in after number five. In other words, he shouldn't have to do with the things we have discussed so far this evening. Your odds are not very good, by the way. 
if you're here tonight and you're not married, I would figure right away that you're going to begin on step one. Your first job is to teach her she's pretty nice and she's worthy of loving herself. If you're fortunate, you come on step six. Now, step six is a need. Now, if I'm going to play the female role to a restaurant, do I have to be hungry? If I'm going to play the female role to the airlines tonight, do I have to be needing to go someplace? If I'm going to play a female role to an employer, do I need a job? Now, I can go on and on and on all the way down the line, the female role, before she can actually involve herself in any role relationship, she has to have a need. Can I actually have a relationship with a salesman tonight if I do not need his product? No, first comes the need. Now, there's an interesting thing about the need, and let's clarify it. In most situations, the need is dormant. This is tremendously fascinating because the creator has created the female role dormant. And at first you might not think this is right, but when you study it very closely, you'll find that the creator did a wonderful thing here. You say, well, when I went to work for this man, was my need dormant? Yes. You thought you needed money to buy food, didn't you? In other words, you thought you were going to work to buy money to pay for the clothes for your children. We're saying that you think when you go to work, you need subsistence. Now, a skillful employer knows that that's only one-tenth of your need structure. So, he will do what to all the dormant needs that you don't even know about? Well, they paint beautiful signs with positions on them. And you start looking at these positions other people have that are above you, and pretty soon one day you decide, I have a need. What is it? For a new position. I know some people will make fun of this and say it's just titles. Be it titles as it may, if you don't know the use of titles, then you don't do too well in business. Because these people really need them. You want a spirit of belonging, do you not? Or do you like to feel like you're part of the group? Now, did you realize I could go on for another three hours describing needs that you actually have and that a boss can actually bring out of you that are now dormant? And if you have a skillful boss and he brings all of these out of you, will you need a raise? No, I know situations where people are working and they are, other people are offering them a fourth more money. And what do you think they're going to do? Well, I've got it made. Nobody else knows how. But in their own mind, they're satisfied that this is the best place to work in the world. This means, has a boss found every dormant need? I think a salesman will understand what I mean by dormancy. Are there products tonight that you need that you don't know you need? Yes, there are. There are products tonight that you don't know exist yet. Do you realize that? In other words, now what's a salesman's job? to come along and arouse your dormant needs. I think to really illustrate this, let's do it biologically. If a girl does not masturbate, in other words, I'm assuming that she doesn't, her sexual desires are dormant. Did you know that? Biologically, she is a dormant being. Does she realize she needs a man? I know some of you are beginning to think real quick, well, you don't know the girl in our neighborhood. Well, maybe I really do. Maybe I know what she has done already. In other words, has she been aroused? Maybe you gentlemen will not understand what the ladies here know perfectly well what I'm saying, that the sexual needs are dormant until when? Until the male role arouses these needs, and then are they ever dormant again? No. Now, do you have a problem if the one who arouses them does not assume the responsibility? I could carry that a little further and tell you that every single prostitute on the face of the earth tonight is whose fault? Some man. Now, you might think, is that the only need that a wife has? No. I was talking to one group and they thought that the needs of a wife was subsistence. 
That is nonsense. Over half the American women tonight, if they would walk off and leave their families and leave their husbands, could get a job to raise themselves to a higher subsistence level than they now have. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that your wife can have better clothes, in most cases, apart from you than with you. Then what in the world is she hanging around for? The need is not basic material provision in our society. Her basic need is to be crowned. And not with a frying pan. <laughs> she is to be crowned as queen. And I wouldn't stop saying just your home. And I wouldn't stop with the United States. I wouldn't stop with this earth. I'd go to the universe. In other words, she should be crowned queen. Now, can she be crowned queen on her own? No, the only place you're going to be crowned queen is with a king. So now you know why she's been with you for 20 years. She's still waiting and still hoping. <laughs> One of these days, he'll crown me queen. But it's also interesting to know that a lot of women do not know that they have a need to be crowned queen. And by the way, if you wanted to keep her ignorant of the fact, you shouldn't have brought her here tonight. <laughs> because basically within her is the desire to be put up on top of the pedestal. In other words, she's to be crowned queen, treated as a queen, and it's the father's duty to tell every child who the queen is and to teach the children how to respect the queen. Because the real dignity of a queen is lost when she comes down off the throne and tells Junior who she is. In other words, Junior has to already be informed how you treat the queen. In other words, the Queen of England, how do they teach the people in the British Empire how to treat the queen? Does the queen do it? No, she doesn't. Isn't that beautiful? She doesn't have to teach anybody how to treat her. And if she did, she would lose her status. So we're saying then tonight that a woman's dormant need <coughs> is to be crowned queen. And if we had a system tonight where you could vote secretly, I would ask how many women did not know your need was to be queen. Then I would realize how many men had kept their wives ignorant of this dormant need. I realize it's expensive to have a queen. And you might have to work harder because queens require special things. Special clothes, special treatment, special flowers, all kinds of special things. Maybe you don't even have a castle yet. But if there's no castle and if there's no queen, <coughs> then you haven't got a throne either. What I'd probably do if I were you is build my castle. I would get a job start working, I'd show that there was a man there, a man worthy of a queen. Should you be afraid to arouse the dormant need in the female role tonight if you're in the male role? No. Arouse it to the full hill, because do you know you can satisfy it? Of course you can. You say, well, I'm not so sure you don't know my wife's tastes. Well, I happen to know that when the female role truly reveres the male role, what happens to him? Well, you see, all at once he grows up and he does things and exploits that he didn't know he could do yesterday. I've seen this happen over and over. Probably one of the greatest motivating forces in my life are female roles who got mixed up somewhere along the line and thought I was twice as great as I was. <laughs>